was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> there was stuff happening at the retreat. There were a lot of people packed in a very hot room. <laughs> this is a call. This is a call to the front. Call to the front. Mr. Rodriguez, call to the front. Mr. Rodriguez, the principal's office, please. <laughs> My name is Chris Dreisbach, and I am super excited that you guys are all here. Uh, let's give a round of applause for Night of Recovery. <laughs> this microphone has a wire on it, so I would stand up, but I'm afraid I'm going to trip. And honestly, if I trip, I'm afraid somebody in row one or two will be injured. <laughs> so I might just stay sitting. Is that okay? Y'all yeah. all right? All right. Can you hear me okay in the back? Ronnie. All right. Huh? Eh? <laughs> all right. Well, listen, tonight's night of recovery, I'm going to tell you a little story because I fancy myself a bit of a storyteller at times. And this story starts with, we began planning this night in September 2023. That was a long time ago, like six months, seven months, something like that. And originally, this night of recovery was going to be held in the beautiful castle, Lancaster County Prison. <laughs> Woo! Woo! How many of you guys have been in that castle that's not afraid to admit it? That's a healthy number of people in this room. Now, real quick, for those of you who have been in that castle or incarcerated in a similar facility like I was numerous times, how incredible would this have been when we were in jail? How amazing would it have been to be in the darkest moment of your life and to see some light? Amazing. Unfortunately, there was some kind of paperwork snafu that occurred somewhere within the county solicitor office. And unfortunately, we had uh, six days to find a new place to hold the night of recovery. Go Retreat. Thank you, Retreat, for hosting this. <laughs> Serious thank you for that, because putting on an event like this in six days takes a lot of human effort. It takes a lot of human heart, and it takes a lot of love. And I'll tell you what, Retreat has that in spades, and they gave it to us, and they're showing it to us right now. So... Tonight, I want to talk a little bit about facing adversity and overcoming adversity. Because for those of you who are in this room, which is all of you, I don't know if you got that, you have overcome a ton of adversity to get here. Whether you are in recovery, whether you are a loved one of someone in recovery, whether you are a community member genuinely curious about what recovery could look like, you're a human. And all of us as humans have faced adversity in so many different ways. And if I look back on the 17 years of my recovery, I have faced adversity in so many different areas, so many different ways, and so many different years, and so many different times. And each one of those difficulties has molded me and shaped me into something better. Each time. And let me tell you, when I got the email from the county solicitor, I was mad. If you know me, you know I get mad like once every 365 days. You know, it's not a common occurrence in my world, but I was legitimately mad because I felt like there was a great injustice, right? Thankfully, I have a tremendous support network around me. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that concept, but once we enter recovery, we build a group of people around us that love us and pull us back up when we're acting like idiots. And thankfully, I have a tremendous support network. And they said to me, Chris, like, why are you upset? And I said, because I want to go into that prison and give some hope to the hopeless, right? I want to give some heart to somebody who's missing it, right? And so thankfully, they were like, well, look, 
there's still a ton of people out here in the world not wearing a monochrome colored uniform in a, a, an old castle, you know? And so like, why don't you reach out to some friends? Let's see if we can't get a venue within six days and put this thing together. And I can tell you, as I sit here in front of all of you, I am so thankful that I faced adversity and I didn't push back and I didn't bother with that stuff because it was out of my control. And the vast majority of what I have learned in the last 17 years is some of the greatest things ever can come out of my control. All of the positivity that has happened to me has truly been out of my control. And my reaction to what occurs is what matters the most because that is one thing I can control. Thankfully, I did not act the way I wanted to, which was not nice. Thankfully, I got together a beautiful team of people who put this event on tonight. So, if any of the speakers want to talk about some adversity they may have faced tonight, hey Zeus, I don't know if you faced any adversity. Uh, certainly it was a simple path here from yeah. Los Angeles, right? It's right up the road, very close. But truly, this night of recovery is about education. This night of recovery is about impactful stories. This night of recovery is about triumph over tragedy. And hopefully, by the end of hearing these incredible stories, you feel a little bit more inspired. No matter where you are on the journey of recovery, whether you're in it or not, whether you're struggling mightily right now, it does not matter to us. You are in this room. We are all sharing a common energy. We are all sharing a common heart. And I am so grateful that you guys are here. So I get to introduce you to our first speaker of the evening. He is sitting directly to my left. left I had to do it I was like yeah, over here I got to meet this guy I'll let him tell you I'll let him tell you the whole story it was a little bit over two years ago but I picked him up from the Harrisburg International Airport at like two o'clock in the morning and I had never met him face to face before and we're two funny looking dudes at two o'clock in the morning at the Harrisburg International Airport and I could tell you in the last two plus years this guy has done everything possible for his own recovery and everything possible to build the lives of people around him. And that is something that I am personally ultra, ultra proud of. But I have a feeling after this 20 some minutes of him talking, you're gonna be pretty proud of him too and excited to know him. So with that, I'm gonna give you my good friend, Mr. Jesus Rodriguez. <laughs> So thank you guys for being here. Uh, my name is Jesus, I'm alcoholic. He basically already kind of went through most of the brief summary of how this kind of came about, but there's a whole lot that kind of went into it. Originally from Los Angeles, California. My parents are immigrants from Mexico. Uh, when they came over, they didn't have anything. So they, you know, we growing up, we didn't have a lot. Uh, my crib was a box with clothing. Uh, we didn't have a TV until maybe I was like, I don't know, maybe eight or nine, if that. I would be lying to you if I were to tell you that I grew up in a broken house. I would be lying to you that if, if I grew up in, a, in with parents that had issues. So growing up, I mean, I grew up in, in El Barrio, in Los Angeles, and we grew up around a lot of, you know, discrimination, uh, and then even till this day and age, we still experience it. But overall, as a whole, honestly, I mean, I had a pretty good childhood. My parents were very supportive of whatever sport I was in at the time. It was soccer, so I played soccer for 12 years or so. My mom was was always the, the main drive to getting myself and my sister, you know, to events or whatever, uh, school events. My dad had multiple jobs, so, you know, to, to support us. So even though my dad technically wasn't around, he was around. He, w he was just always working. And I'll get into that a little bit later. When in high school, I started uh, wrestling slightly, and then eventually that program got cut, so I had to leave that a little bit. And after that, I kind of got into professional wrestling. I used to watch it on TV, and at the time, it was awesome. All I knew at the time was Lucha Libre from Mexico, which is very colorful and animated, and they fly around a lot, and they have the mask and the capes, and to me, it was amazing, right? And then eventually, I started doing like the whole backyard wrestling thing, and that's kind of how it came about. And then it, I eventually decided to, to, to do it professionally. So I got, went and I got trained to do professional wrestling. And it was an awesome experience. I fell in love with it from the get-go. 
And during that time, I was juggling between training f four or five days a week to resting on the on the weekends to maintaining my full time job, which at the time was a graphic designer for the adult inter industry. Uh, so that was fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was you know I mean as LA, so it was LA, and uh, so that was that was a, a fun little mix, and then it kept me busy. And so that's eventually, in 2010, I got a tryout with this little company called WWE. And I got hired on the spot, which is awesome, right? And then that kind of set in motion a whole array of different events that, that changed my life. Some for the better, and then some that obviously led me to where I ended up. During that time frame, we got very lucky that we got to be placed on the main stage. We did our WrestleManias. We did our main pay-per-views. We were doing global events. We got to perform at Madison Square Garden multiple times. We did the European tours. We did international tours. We have action figures. We were on video games. Uh, we were on the billboards on the marquee, right? And that was awesome. I was 24 years old, and I got to travel. I got to experience what life was as a superstar. I never grew around that, so I didn't know how to take it, right? So you can already kind of get an idea of where this is going. But it didn't start there, though. It started back when I was younger. Obviously, in the Latino community, I mean, it's very common to just drink a beer, to have a couple of drinks on the weekends. Obviously, uh, we were in high school, so we would sneak in our water bottles with vodka during math because I hated math, and I still do. So, and then there was no way in hell, and I say this a lot, there was no way in hell the teachers didn't know that we weren't drinking. There was no way in hell the teachers couldn't smell it. But there we were, right? Because we're awesome. So then, obviously, once I started traveling and be on the road, I got to experience a lot more of it. And, you know, we were doing these European tours. We were on the road constantly. And, you know, we were living that rock and roll lifestyle. And it was fun until it wasn't. At first, it was great. I was so young. I, 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 my body couldn't get rid of it in a, in a night. And I'd be up the next day, and I'd be fine and dandy. And obviously, the more we do it, the more our body says, hey, slow down. But we're like, no, man, we don't do that. And then eventually, after a couple of years, it, I, I left the company. I had gone to a point where it got out of control, and it wasn't something that I realized at the time why they stopped putting me in certain positions until I realized why they weren't putting me in those positions anymore because I was constantly drunk. But at the time, I was so good at blaming everybody else. I was so good at this is happening to me because of them. They hate me. Something's going on over there. But I never realized until way later that they couldn't trust me to be placed in these positions because I was always intoxicated. I was drugged out. Once I got accused of it and I was like, no, and then I went and did it just to prove them, if they're gonna accuse me, they might as well go do it. Yeah, right? Because I'm a thinker. So then I, I left the company and at the time, like I said, we were placed on everything. We were doing main events. We were, we were doing very well. And I say that uh, alongside the person that I was on TV with, right? So we were basically a, part, a tag team in a sense. So I, everything that he was on, I was on. So I was also benefiting from being on these appearances. So I was doing very well financially. When I left and I lived in Orlando at the time, I had a lot of time and I had a lot of money and I had a lot of boredom and I had this whole void of, I no longer had that adrenaline rush anymore. That light, that red light on the camera was gone and I had nobody that really cared anymore whatever I did, in my head at least. I got so used to just what my party circle was that for a good couple, maybe a year or so, if that, I was still the one inviting everybody out to the parties. I was the one paying for all the alcohol, for all the drugs. If we were going to a club, we would take all the, you know, take the girls back to the house and have a great time. And I was, I was that guy. I was a supplier, basically. And I didn't realize that that's why people were hanging around with me. So then ultimately, of course, that ran out. And then as that ran out, so did the people. And again, right, I was so good at blaming everybody else. They're leaving me because they're, you know, gold diggers and they're, they hate me. Whatever the reason was, right, right? I started getting a lot more bitter. I started getting more angry and I hated everything. I didn't want to be around. I, I, the, the whole concept of people as a whole just angered me so much. And I didn't know how to deal with that. I didn't know how to process being by myself. All I knew was alcohol. All I knew was drugs. All I knew was that makes me feel happy. That makes me feel good. I no longer have people around me. I no longer have that camera in front of me. So what can supplement that void? Alcohol, right? Because that'll make me feel good. 
even if even if it's for a couple of minutes for an hour or so never mind the fact that when i wake up i'm gonna feel like garbage during that time frame also though that i was on the road we were constantly go 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 right so i also developed a little bit of insomnia because i was so used to just we would finish our shows and then that's just probably like around 11 we would get out of there by midnight out of the city by midnight drive to the next town get there maybe i don't know two three in the morning wake up early go to the gym go to breakfast and go back to the arena right so that became the lifestyle of five days a week or so if we had appearances that instead of going home we would go from on on a tuesday night or wednesday morning we would go from whatever town we were in fly to let's say miami or new york do appearances and go back to on the road for on a friday or saturday right so we're go 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 so when it was all gone i don't know what to do with myself nobody was around me i was miserable i hated everybody i hated being around people and don't get me wrong i still have days where i'm done peopling at like eight in the morning but i'm able to tolerate a little bit more now but during that, that time frame, my biggest thing was, well, it's 7 o'clock. The store is open. I can go get some booze. I can't get liquor because that's not until 11, but the four locals are there. I can get those. And then for three bucks, man, that was like the best buzz you can get. And that's all I knew, right, because that's what I had. So during this whole process of the, the insomnia, at the time when I first started with it, all I had was wine because wine would make me sleepy. So then you have a glass of wine, fine, and as the, the habit goes in, the one glass doesn't work, so then two glasses and three glasses and the whole bottle eventually. Then the whole bottle doesn't work, so now you're going into the box wine because you can get more for the same price, right? Because we're, 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 we're savers, we're economical here. But then you feel like garbage the next morning, and then you're spitting up purple, and then I was like, I don't want to do that anymore. Hey, the four locos, right? So that became like my thing for two, three years roughly, easily, easily was the Four Locos, because I can get one of them, I'm buzzed, I'm good, I can, it set me off for the day, and then I would go into two, three, four, right, until I realized how much sugar is in that thing, and then your teeth get all messed up, and then you have like the most terrible hangover, and it sucked, and that became my thing. There would be cans all over, all over my apartment, there were cans all over the house, rather, eventually an apartment. There'd be bottles of vodka all over the place, because I didn't want to drink brown uh, liquor, because that's too much sugar. Right. I want to be cool. Right. 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 Because I'm trying to get better. So I would constantly just go and get like the cheap bottles of vodka because I realized that the there's too much sugar in the Four Locos. So I would go get vodka, but I would get like the very low tier one, like the pop off. That's like a jug for like 10 bucks. And I can chug the whole thing by myself straight. Right. That's how good I was. So when people were saying I had a drinking problem, I was like, no, I got it down. Watch me. So it became a thing, right? People didn't want to be around me. I was constantly throwing up. I was, I smelled like alcohol. I was smelling like booze. I kept pissing myself. I kept waking up with just like my bed just covered in urine. I would just flip the mattress or I would try to Windex it or because or, the smell would cover it. And I would constantly have to get new mattresses because I just kept pissing all over the place. And anywhere I went, right, I started getting a lot of weight. I started getting a lot of weight. I wasn't being booked anywhere. Nobody wanted to be around me. Again, right, because I, I I'm so good at self-victimizing. This is happening to me because of them. It's all them. It's not me. It's not, I don't have an issue. It's them. And I got so good at that. I kept waking up in detox centers at the hospital. I, kept, I would wake up in alleyways because I would go wake, wake up early to go walk to like the, the store that's like three blocks away or so. And I would take an alleyway there. And I would drink the whole thing on my way back and I would pass out. And I would wake up a couple hours later just passed out in the alleyway by a dumpster. But in my head, I'm this big superstar, right? I have this ego that, that was feeding me to like, no, this is fine, you're good. Who's gonna tell you anything? Nobody's gonna tell you anything. Then I got this opportunity to go to India, out of nowhere. And I ended up moving to India for six months. I opened up a wrestling school in India, and that was awesome. This is probably the first time that I had gotten clean for X amount of time in such a while. It was a beautiful culture, beautiful people. The food was delicious. Uh, I got to learn so much. I got to experience the Taj Mahal, and it was beautiful, awesome experience. But, you know, you have that little devil in you that's like, man, you know, it's been a couple months. And then you see somebody have, or you see somebody have a drink, you're like, I missed that. And it just so happened that somebody, I had asked somebody, I was like, hey, do you know where we can get alcohol? Because it's a very conservative area, right, especially in that area that we were in, a small little town. And they had told me that I have to go to a certain house. So it's kind of like the speakeasy. You have to go to a certain house and knock. And then you just kind of like give them the money and they'll come back. They'll close it and they'll come back with the bottle. And I learned where it was. 
so I would sneak out of the academy like around 10 o'clock when it would get dark. And I would go walk over there and, you know, get my bottle and take it back. And I was like, nah, I'm fine. But I was a good Aki, right? Because then I would take the, the, the bottles in the morning and I would check the whole thing. And I would just chuck it out. I would go to the, the roof and then chuck it out to some, like, farm field that was next to us. And I'm sure at some point they found all the bottles. But they never told me anything about it. I come back to the U. Well, I went to Australia for a little bit after that. And I spent time in Australia. And then, obviously, alcohol is legal or more openly used. So I went back to my BS for a couple of months. And then I got time in Europe. So I spent time in Europe, in England, uh, in Germany. I did time in Spain. And I come back to the U.S. And I was like, no, nah, I got this. I'm, I'm cool. I'm good. And then I go back to my bullshit. I cuss a lot. Sorry. I try not to, but it's really fucking hard. So I come back to the U.S. I'm in Orlando. And then at this point, right, I had lost all this weight when I was overseas. And I come back to, the, to Orlando and I, I go back to my BS and I start eating, right, because I don't want to work out. I'm constantly drunk. I'm hungover. And when I'm hungover, all I want to do, there's a steak and shake next door. So I can just go get a couple burgers, come back, eat, and then fall asleep. And I wake up, sober up, go get more booze. And it's a cycle, right? It repeats a cycle. So obviously my, there was no love life because who the hell wants to be with this heifer at that point? He was always drunk and eating. And, and I was just, um, I was miserable. I hated everybody. I didn't want to be around anybody. Then fast forward, I leave there. I go to Texas. I moved to Texas for a little bit. I was fine for a little while, and I go right back to my BS. As soon as I found out where the store was, I went. I was constantly there. 7 o'clock in the morning. And, oh, man, like, they're about to close. It's almost 11 o'clock. I have to go get there before, before they close up so I have something for, for the night. And I go back to the same thing, right? I was just constantly just drunk and then just urinating all over myself, throwing up all over myself. My room smelled like garbage, like terrible. Until at that time, my roommates were like, hey, man, you got to chill. Uh, this is too much. Uh, we can smell it. We can smell the urine. We can smell the, the, the puke. I had this bad habit of becoming like Iron Chef at like 3 in the morning. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It, I mean, yeah, find it funny. But like at 3 in the morning, I'm, I'm grabbing the raw steaks and I'm just eating them. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't care. I'm still alive, so I didn't die from it. And then they're like, hey, man, you got to stop. You, you can't do this anymore. I was like, all right, so I, I won't bring alcohol in. And then they, they, they were good with that for a little while. But again, I'm an alcoholic, right? So I would constantly go get booze, and I would hide them in the bushes. I would hide the bottles in the bushes. So then I would go out and get on a call and then chug my bottles outside. I would find the bottles, and I would pull them out, and I would start drinking them. Eventually, obviously, they found out. So they started throwing all of my stuff away. As this was going on, I got an offer to go down to Mexico City. So I got to work on a TV show behind the scenes. I was producing a TV show down in Mexico City. Obviously, over there is a lot more open. You can just go. You can be like 14 and get alcohol. No big deal. I go back to my repetitive you know, actions and what I know. When we finished the season, I realized I hadn't seen my parents in a while. I hadn't gone back to L.A. in a while. So I was like, let me go home. So I went home. I had time. We had time before they're going to film the next season. So then I go, and then COVID happened. So then COVID happened, and everything shut down. My car, everything was still in Texas, and then I was in L.A., and nothing was happening. So we couldn't fly. Nothing, right? Nothing. Everything shut down. So I was stuck in L.A. And it just so happens that around the corner was a liquor store. So you can only imagine I had nothing to do, and there's a liquor store. So sure enough, that became my routine for a good while. I was at my mom's house, and yeah, I destroyed, I destroyed that place. I, I, I made it smell like urine quick. There was vomit all over the place. I, I destroyed the kitchen. And then my mom constantly cried, you know, because she was trying to help me. And she kept trying to push me to, to go and seek help. And I was like, ah, what do you know? You know, like, I'm fine. I can handle this. Sure enough, right? Like, I, it, it got to a point on May 5th of 2000, 2000 I think it was, where... She dragged my ass to a rehab center, detox center. And I went and I spent five days there. I got out, they put me on Vivitrol. And I did really well. I was good and, and, and dandy for, for a good while. As that was going on too, I got this call and I got this offer to go to Cairo, Egypt. So I went to Cairo, Egypt for a year and I spent a year in Cairo. And I opened up a wrestling school there. Now because of the visas, uh, it's every three months, you have to go in and out. So Italy was right there, Spain was right there, France was right there. So I would just constantly go jump over, go spend the weekend and then come back. And then my time was done there. I come back to the US and I go to LA. And then of course, like a good Aki. In Cairo, it's more, it's a very Muslim conservative area. So they don't advertise alcohol like they do here in the States, right? You have to kind of know where it's at. 
And then I go back to my BS. And then eventually I end up in, in San Antonio. And during this time, I just kept waking up in detox. I kept waking up in the alleyway. I kept waking up in, in a car with the door open, my wallet just like on the front. And then one day I woke up in the detox center. And then out of all the times that I had woken up at the hospital, this is the only time I ever had my phone, right? Because they usually take your stuff. It's the only time I had my phone. And I was sitting there and I was laying in bed and I was like, man, I'm like, hey, what am I doing? At this point, I had angered and pissed off everybody that I knew, everybody that I thought that, that loved me. I had you know, told them to go F themselves. I, I, I hated everybody. I didn't want to be around anybody. I had told literally everybody to go fuck themselves. What am I doing with my life? And I go on Twitter and I, I said, uh, I need help. I messed up or I messed up. I need help. And it just so happens that this fella, who's never on Twitter, happened to see it. And then he sends me a message, and he's like, hey, uh, if you're really serious about getting help, uh, let's, let's talk. So then I also know that the, you know, the WWE has this company and uh, this, this program that helps you out if you ever need help with this kind of situation. So I had contacted some of my old coworkers. I was like, hey, can you give me the info? I got that info, and then I had mentioned that I was speaking to, to Chris, and they're like, oh, we know who that is. Go ahead, set it up, and we'll figure it out from there. I was like, cool. I said yes to him, and I lo started looking up where Lancaster was. Lancaster was. And I was like, man, it's farm fields. Like, there's nothing. And I say this joke a lot, but I mean it. I, I looked at what he looked like, and I was like, man, if this guy, like, takes me to, a, like, a shed, <laughs> if he takes me to, like, a silo, and, like, he ties me up and just comes out in a robe and it tells me to put lotion on my skin, then you know what? <laughs> then you know what? I mean, at this point, like, I've, I've had a good life. <laughs> but honestly, though, honestly, though, like, at this point in my, in, in my life, I had honestly tried so much to do this by myself. I had tried to get sober. I had tried to get clean by myself. I had tried every tactic. I tried, you know, uh, going to a detox center. I tried uh, everything what I thought was everything. The only thing I had not tried was actually going to rehab. That's the only thing I hadn't tried. Because I was trying to self, to do it by myself, and I realized at that point, I can't do this by myself. There's no way in hell that I can do this by myself. And it wasn't until we agreed to this, and, I, and then on March 23rd, I landed at the Harrisburg Airport, and he picked me up. And I was like, well, here we go. I was scared. I was scared coming up. But at that point, like I said, I had nothing else. I, I, was, I was done. I, I, everything that I had built up, my reputation, my piggy bank, uh, uh, my friends, family, everything, I had thrown it away. I had drank it away. I had given up all of that for the sake of just alcohol. And the only thing I had not tried was actually reaching out and getting help. And then he picked me up. He took me to, to the center, checked me in. So then I was scared shitless. And then I, I get placed in this room with this guy. And bless him. He's super nice, but he was loud as fuck. And I was like, man, what am I doing? Why am I here? I got placed in this room later on, too, when I started going to the centers, to the treatment. And then I was like, what am I doing here? Why am I here in this room with a bunch of alkies? Why am I here in this room with a bunch of druggies? I don't belong here. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a freaking superstar. What, are, what am I doing here with these people? I have nothing that relates me to them. Right? But then the more I started talking to people, the more I started hearing everybody tell the stories, the more I started like, feeling their pain and what they were going through and realizing how some people had already gone through the whole situation and how they got better and what steps they took. I realized that even though we had different backgrounds, we were all fighting the same demon. So I, I needed to attach myself to that. And I needed to give this an actual try. And it wasn't if, if, if it wasn't for the sake of, as it was mentioned already, the support system that comes in with all this, the, the, the actual giving it a legit try and then putting yourself into it and indulging yourself into it, that, that you realize, that like, man, I'm capable of doing some awesome stuff. And the number one thing was getting sober. That, I'm, I'm, I'm super awesome at that because so many people told me that I couldn't do it and so many people gave up on me. You know how, how shitty that feels when, when you're there reaching out for somebody and then they tell you, nah, man, this is, you're, not, you're not my problem. And I get it. Don't get me wrong. Listen, I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. But all it took was, a, was one or two people to go, hey, no, let's, let's, let's figure this out. And I'm grateful that for everybody that gave up on me in my life, for, for, the, for all the times, for example, for all the times that I, I made my mom cry, that I made my sister cry, that I made my, my, my dad you know, uh, uh, cry as well, for, for, for all of that and everybody that left me behind, my parents never left. My sister never left me. 
right? So I'm grateful for that. And for that same reason too, I wanted to get better. If it wasn't for the support system that I have now, two years later, and it actually it just happened, what, two weeks ago that I, I had my two-year my two year chip. If it wasn't for all of that and the support system that has made me to, to, to accomplish all of this, uh, then I don't know where I would have been. I, well, I have an idea. I probably would have been in some casket or some ditch or, you know, in prison. And the castle, I mean. You <laughs> but if it wasn't for that support system, I mean, that's probably what I would have end, ended up in. Because all I knew at the time was alcohol and drinking and then drugging myself and then making me feel numb. Because I didn't want to feel this whole concept of, of a void. I didn't like that feeling. I didn't like feeling empty. So I had to supplement that feeling with, in my case, like I said, alcohol. But I'm thankful now that two years later, I've been able to focus myself and find myself, give myself purpose. Because for so long, all I did was talk. And that's all I did. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm going to get better. I'm going to get clean. I'm not going to drink anymore. So I was talking constantly. It was finally time to like actually walk the walk. And I had to actually put myself out there. And I say this all the time. I hate doing these things because I feel so vulnerable and so scared. But at the same time, this is also my therapy. And I'm thankful that I get to meet people here who are going through a similar process. And hopefully, if, if there's anything that you can take out of this, is that so long as you still have a breathing heart and so long as you still air in your lungs, that there's still hope. And oftentimes, all we have to do, honestly, is just look up and ask. Thank you guys so much. My name is Jesus, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm going to introduce you to the final speaker of the evening. She is Retreat Behavioral Health's own. I've known Maggie for a, a real long time, since like 2011, and I have never known this girl to do anything but help people and be awesome in every way possible. So I'm really excited to sit here and hear what she has to say about her life and her recovery. And with that, I'm going to give you Maggie. Maggie. Is this working? Is it working now? Okay, How, the last speaker, you know? <laughs> like, okay, my name is Maggie Hunt and I am an alcoholic. I have a sobriety date of July 6, 2009. <laughs> I really just wanna thank everybody for being here tonight because this night, seriously, is actually about you guys. I would not be sober today unless I was like talking to new people, hearing about their experiences. So you are all so important and I just want you to know that because I used to go to meetings and I, you know, they're like, oh, the newcomer is the most important person in the room. And that's awesome, your first meeting. But then you keep going and there's like this middle ground where you're like, maybe you're smoking a cigarette on the side. You're like, oh my God, this sucks. I'm gonna have to go to meetings for the rest of my life. But you are important. And like that, that middle ground, like it gets better. Sobriety gets better, it continues to get better. I just wanna say, cause I know I'm not gonna keep you guys here long but I'll just tell you a little bit about what it was like, what happened and what it's like now, probably mostly about what it's like now, because I got to, I don't have, like I was not in the WWE, you know what I mean? I'm from Bucks County, Pennsylvania, Doylestown. I am, I, I say that because I used to say it was, I was from Philly because it's just way harder, you know what I mean? Like it just sounds so much cooler if you say that you're from Philadelphia <laughs> until you meet someone from Philadelphia and they're like, where? And I'm like, not there, you know, so anyway. <laughs> From the time I was 16 years old until the time I got sober at 21, I was in and out of treatment. My life looked a mess. I was falling apart at the seams. I felt like everybody else had this guide to life that I didn't have. And I would be really, I, I always like felt like I was coming in the back door. Everybody else was always really good friends with other people and I just didn't understand like what, what like my malady was. And so I continued to go to treatment and I continued to do all of the wrong things every time I got out of treatment. I would come to a meeting like this and I would listen to the speaker. And if I did not think they were cool or hard or like, like me at all, I immediately be like, this sucks, oh my God. And I also didn't wanna listen to like once they got sober because I just could not see my life being any different than what it was now. And I was like, I'm just gonna go in and out of treatment and like, you know, my family would get really excited. And the first time I went to treatment, I had all these really cool letters. And then like the last time I went to treatment, I don't even know if people knew because I had been in so many times. And so, you know, I got sober at 21 years old. I still have not had like a, a legal drink at a bar, but recovery has brought me the most amazing life that is so beyond my wildest dreams. And I used to hate when people would say that. I never thought that I would find a man who like truly loves me for me and all my crazy, truly. Um, I feel like you can reinvent yourself at, at, at any point, like when on your path to recovery. 
I just didn't think I was going to have the things that I have. I'm actually a mother. I have three children. The last time I got high, I overdosed. And I, thank God I was like, I, I, had this, I had this power struggle when it comes to like my alcoholism. So like, I think I know better. I think I know better than the law. I think I know better than all these things. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to overdose because I know what my limit is. I know that like, if I just use this much, it won't work until it didn't. And I always had like these yes, nothing's going to happen yet, nothing's going to happen yet. And then every, all of those yes all came true. So I went to treatment for the last time. And I had the, the, my last year that I was sober, I went to treatment like more months than I was like out there using because like the only thing my family would do would just keep me back in treatment. And I got sober because I would always go to treatment and go home to my mom's house. And she would be like, oh, we have to change people, places, and things. And she would like paint my room. And I'd be like, yay, you know, like I'm going to stay sober. But I would, I, you know, I would go to meetings. I just, I, I did not want a 12-step program to be what my life looked like because for me, just being sober is awful. I could never just make it to 90 days. And I would go into meetings and like I would hear them talk about the steps and they would be like, whoa, hon, slow down. It's about the journey, not the destination. And I didn't understand what that meant. So I would go in, I would stay sober for like 90 days and then I would be out. The last time I got sober, I decided to go to an extended care program. Um, I had never done that before. And thank God that I did, because in that extended care program, I found a connection and a support group like that Chris was talking about that was like beyond my wildest dreams. I would go into treatment and I would be like the best one in treatment. I'd be like president of the community. And like I loved the community feeling that I would feel when I would go into treatment. And then I would get out of treatment and it would not be the same. And I didn't know how to like put those pieces together. I went to a meeting. I, I went to extended care, and at this extended care, I still thought like I was pretty cool, you know, like I knew everything, because I had never actually like read the big book. Once you go to treatment one time and you learn like the lingo of what they say in treatment, it's really easy to say those things and get everybody off your back. So they'll be like, "What are you gonna do when you get home?" I'm gonna get a sponsor. I'm gonna go to meetings. That, and they're like, "Oh my god, that's so great. Do that." And then, that's it. They, they leave you alone. Like they don't want to ask ask any more questions. I was also really young when I got sober, and I would go to meetings. And people would talk about, you know, like, we're all powerless over alcohol, right? And so am I. And so they're like, you have to go to these meetings so that you can, like, gain the power. But I was, there was a lot of meetings that I would go to that people would share their story. And I'd be like, I feel like I need a meeting after this meeting because I was not hearing any type of, like, recovery. And maybe that was just supposed to be my path. Maybe I was supposed to go in and out of treatment and all those things. But at the last time, I actually opened the big book. I thought that when you read the big book that it was like written in the 1930s. I'm like, it doesn't really apply to me today, okay? Like it's, you know, really old. And um, I learned how to live. I was 21 years old. I didn't know how to write a check. I knew how to like pull money out of my bank account and like not have it in there and then change bank accounts. But like I didn't, you know, I didn't know how to live. I was 20, like, you know, a lot of people like feel like they have to like forget everything they learned. I needed to learn how to live. I didn't even know how to make friends when I first got sober. I remember like ask, like, cause you, I like that community atmosphere. And in that community atmosphere, like you make friends with people because you have to, right? So like, you don't really have to be like, oh, can you be my friend? And I, when I went to AA for the first time, like in this, I, I had to go to Scranton, Pennsylvania, which is that actually it was called Moscow, Pennsylvania, where I had to go. It was like an extended care program. And I was like, you're sending me to this awful place. When I got there, I like had to ask someone how to be my friend. I had to ask someone how to do the laundry because I was like really spoiled by my mother. She meant, you know, like if love could have got me sober, I definitely would have been sober a long time before I was. However, that's not really how that works. They probably would have loved me to death by enabling me in that, in that way. My father is also a drug addict and he and I like would use together. And so when I finally got sober, I had to come out with that secret. I had to tell some things and I just, I saw what Alcoholics Anonymous could do. And I didn't believe that they could do it for me, but somebody else said, oh, well, that, you know, it, do you see it working for me? And I did, and I believed them. And I did not think I was going to be able to purchase a car. My first car in sobriety was a 1991 Ford Tempo with over 200,000 miles, and I drove that car like it was a Mercedes because... <laughs> Because if you ever, like I used to have to walk, I worked at the Giant and I had to walk to work and I had to walk to work in the snow and I'm like, sobriety sucks. You know, and every, my mom would be like, you're building character. And I'd be like, I don't need to build character. 
and I told myself, I was like, okay, if I stay sober for a couple months and my life doesn't get significantly better, I can always go back out and use. It's always going to be there. I don't need, I don't need to change people, places, and things. I don't need a phone number. I don't need any of these things. And so I remember like, you know, a couple months went by and things got better and better. And like, I had the car, I had an apartment with a roommate. I always wanted to like meet him in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I quite met quite a few of him in Alcoholics Anonymous. Again, that power thing, I like don't think that I'm ever going to get pregnant. Met someone in the rooms, boy meets guy in AA clubhouse, true romance. And, um, you know, we, and I was pregnant and that individual did not stay sober. And I had a support network that was around me that like lifted me up and like taught me how to be a mother, taught me what to do. And people were not happy about it because they were like, you're so selfish. Like all we had to do your whole life was like help you to get sober. Now you're sober. Now you're going to, you know, um, you're going to use, we're going to have to take care of this baby. It's going to be a whole thing. But that little boy literally saved my life. And I, I think oftentimes of what recovery would look like, I did not think that it was going to be the way that it is. I'm in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, not because by choice. I, I, the treatment center that I went to multiple times, I got really close with the owner. He saved my life. And, uh, well, he, you know, his tri- the treatment center saved my life, and he was always supportive. He was like, I'm going to open a treatment center in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and I want you to come work here. And I was like, Lancaster County? Why? Nobody's ever going to go to Lancaster County to get sober. <laughs> and I lived, I, I, I moved out of Scranton, and I lived in Doylestown at the time, and I was driving like an hour and a half to work because I was working with individuals in recovery, and it was so cool. And I always thought I was so different until like I met, you know, like I went to treatment 10 times and some of like the old timers would be like, oh, well, I spilled more alcohol than you drank, blah, blah, you know. And so I finally like started to talk to more people and they would, and they feel the same way that I did, you know, like they would be like, oh, you don't understand. Like I'm the worst, I'm the the worst one in, in this room, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, you're not actually, because I am. I already made all the mistakes for you. You don't have to worry about it. I work at Retreat Behavioral Health. Obviously, I've worked at Retreat since I was 22 years old. We opened in 2011 here, and I met Chris, and I, I, there was a community that was built of people in recovery that was beyond anything I've ever seen before. The recovery in Lancaster County, I have never been, and I've been to places, I've been to meetings all over the place, but the recovery in Lancaster County is so profound. You know, you have such diverse, you have such diverse people, you have so much love, you have so much experience. And so if you're new here and you're thinking about staying, please stay. We need you. We need you here. We need more people in recovery. Like the human voice is everyone is like your instrument. You know what I mean? How are you using your instrument in the world? And that's, you know, what I think that this night is about. I think about sharing people's experiences is about. Uh, I moved to Lancaster County. Since moving to Lancaster County, I never, I I like would do this thing when I got sober. I'd be like, I'm going to go to school and school's going to keep me sober until like, you know, I would go to class and then like I wouldn't go to class and I would sell my books and it was like, you know what I mean? It was like a whole thing. They get, it's a whole thing. And so I never thought I would go back to school. I went back to school. I have two other children, which I just want to share about real quick. Like, so my first child was like, obviously not planned. Beautiful thing saves my life. I met my husband. He was working at the same treatment center as I, and I was like, no one's ever going to love me because I have this baby. At first, like, you know, he wasn't sure because like, you know, he's not sure. Like, uh, put some water on it and there's like a family and then he met my son he was like I want you know I want to do this with you I'm I'm all in and since then he's been all in <laughs> and like it's not easy you know what I mean Be- <laughs> Ma- being married you know to an out to someone who is also in recovery as well obviously sober longer than me so you know always reminds me of that but like we create a home of like, we've never lived by ourselves without with our children because we've always had like some new guy getting sober, some new family member of mostly mine because my family has alcoholism all over. We try to build a home that spreads the message of hope and the promise of freedom because that's what, like we were given. Thank you so much for being here. If you're not sure and you're like, oh, you know, I don't know if I can do this, like you're capable of anything. Imagine right now, that everything tomorrow was just gone. All of your anxieties were just gone. You didn't have to worry about your charges. You didn't have to worry about your bills. You just were like mindful and you were just here. Like what would you do with it? How would you change who you are? Because you can do that all the time. 
two years ago, I, I, I danced my whole life. Like on, I danced um, uh, jazz, tap, ballet. Yeah. I thought that my life, I thought I was going to go to New York and I was going to be like a ballerina and that was going to be my whole life. And unfortunately, the first thing that went, obviously, was that. Two years ago, I went to go see a Broadway show in New York. I was supposed to see Hugh Jackman in The Music Man. However, he decided to move that day. So he was the, you know, he wasn't there. And when I was watching these people, I was like overwhelmed with, because I always just thought I was too old. I'm like, I'm too old to do it. Everybody else has done it for such a long time. And so I decided two years ago that I wanted to like take on my passion and try to you know, take acting classes and do all this. And I was like, you know, I was so afraid of what everybody would think. Um, I also like did, you know, I didn't want anyone to know about it. And imagine like having to tell my husband I was going to do, I was like, oh, hey, um, you know how like we've been together for all this time? Like, you know, you didn't think that this was like my dream. Well, it is. And I want to start it right now. And, um, you know, to have support to be able to do that. I'm saying this mostly because I want you to know that like it's okay to be whoever you want to be and not be afraid of that. If you love country music and you want to listen to country music, lose the fear and just like, who cares? You know what I mean? At the end of the day, when you have to go to bed, you're the only one that's there with you. Yeah, so thank you so much for being here. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask me. We'll be here for a while after the, uh, I'm going to say after the meeting, but it's not a meeting. You know, you can do this and thank you so much. Wow, that was a uh, that was a lot. That was a lot, right? That was awesome. So I want to get a little bit serious and wrap up, if you don't mind. I know we had a lot of good laughs tonight. I know we, you know, got to make fun of me, got to make fun of me again. Uh, you know, got to talk about P a lot. <laughs> but this is a real this is a real thing addiction substance use disorder alcoholism whatever you want to call it mental health it's all super serious right now just in our little community here i don't even know how many people are out there struggling if you think about all across our country how many people are hurting how many people are about to die how many people are just not okay furthermore how many of those people don't even know that hope is real? I can recall in my own life so many times throughout my addiction that I would look and feel like I didn't deserve peace. Feel like I was just a common criminal. Just a guy who belongs behind a cage door wearing a stupid monochrome colored uniform. And that's the best I'm ever going to be. At 20 years old, that was my belief about my life is that this is, this is it. I'm going to go to jail and I'm going to pop back out and maybe the judge will let me go to rehab and then I'm going to pop out of there and I'm going to fail immediately so we can start the process all over again. And the number of people that I meet every single day that have felt that same way is unbelievable. So nights like tonight where we can get together and we can be loud about recovery, we can talk about how much better life gets when we abandon what we think is best for us and follow other people who know what's best for us. And tonight, if you leave with nothing else, leave armed with the facts about recovery, leave with information about how you can help somebody you love get into recovery, and leave here, hopefully, hopefully, with the right heart to help them get there. Because every single person deserves peace every single person deserves hope every single person deserves love regardless of what's going on in their lives so let's all leave here tonight and be a beacon of hope for those around us and thank you all for being here give yourselves a round of applause